everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Michaela Williams, and we'll be discussing Kubernetes RBOC 101. Today's presenter is Oleg Chinukin, CTO at Kubler. If you have any questions, please post them in the chat, and we'll make sure to address them. Okay, let's get started. Okay, Michaela, thank you for the introduction, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the presentation. Um, yes, I'm going to talk about uh, Kubernetes RBOC today, and um, essentially basic mechanisms that Kubernetes uh, has to provide authentication, authorization. Uh, we'll, we'll do some hands-on activities, uh, make sure that there is a number of uh, uh, common snippets for you to test that after the presentation if you want. <coughs> uh, but before I start, uh, I want to uh, give a brief introduction of uh, who we are and why we are doing what we are doing. Um, Essentially, uh, I'm CTO at Kubler. Uh, Kubler is a company which uh, builds a, a platform, Kubernetes, enterprise Kubernetes management platform. Uh, essentially, a tool uh, which a company can use to deploy and operate a fleet of Kubernetes clusters uh, across different environments, different clouds, on-prem, etc., etc. So, and uh, on a higher level, uh, the goal of this tool is to bring together two worlds, cloud native technology stack and uh, 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 strict uh, requirements of an enterprise environment, which is usually uh, much more restrictive and prescriptive uh, in the sense of how things can be done. Um, another dimension of this uh, view of what we are doing is uh, bringing together interests and requirements uh, from different groups inside the larger and mid-sized companies. So groups like developers and uh, operations teams. So, and uh, uh, doing that, so we built a platform called Kubler, uh, uh, which allows you to deploy Kubernetes clusters. Uh, again, as I said, in multiple environments, provides you with centralized uh, operations tools, log collection, monitoring, UI, API, um, infrastructure management uh, and various governance tools, uh, part of which is uh, integration with RBAC, integration with identity management, uh, certificate management, audit, etc. Et and uh, when uh, talking with our clients, working with our customers, uh, what we see often is that it's not usually enough to just provide great tools and great integration capabilities, but um, what's even more important is that our clients understand the capabilities provided by the platform and even more importantly by Kubernetes itself. Uh, because, well, oftentimes when we are asked uh, whether our tool can do this or that, uh, we respond that, well, Kubernetes actually can do this. Mm -hmm. So because uh, Kubernetes has vast number of features, <clears throat> you just need to understand what it can do for you and how to use those features. So this webinar uh, is specifically talking about uh, Kubernetes capabilities. Uh, we will only use Kubler to uh, visualize some of the concepts, but we'll talk about Kubernetes access control as a native capability of Kubernetes. So, and we'll go through various authentication and authorization methods Kubernetes provides. Uh, we'll talk in more details about methods uh, that uh, are more applicable in practice, and uh, you'll see what I mean in a few, in a few minutes. Uh, we'll uh, talk a little bit in more details about RBAC specifically as one of the authorization methods uh, that Kubernetes provides, and uh, stop uh, a bit on various use cases and gotchas and how uh, um, it is practical to start when you are getting familiar with um, RBAC capabilities of Kubernetes. So let's start. Um, what's RBAC and what's uh, access control in Kubernetes? Um, so it's essentially a set of tools and features that allow uh, you or Kubernetes operator administrator to define who can do what uh, in a Kubernetes cluster. And uh, of course, there are a number of uh, concepts that formalize this um, notion and these notions. And three main uh, concepts there are subjects, operations, and resources. Subjects are representative of uh, 
who uh, performs an iterate, uh, iteration in the Kubernetes cluster through Kubernetes API. Uh, an iteration is essentially an action that this person or uh, this component who talks to Kubernetes API wants to perform in the Kubernetes cluster. And resource is um, something inside of a Kubernetes cluster that uh, this action is performed on. In most cases, resources are essentially Kubernetes objects, objects like pods, nodes, config maps, secrets, etc. There are a huge number of those Kubernetes objects in Kubernetes clusters. You can check uh, Kubernetes API to get an exhaustive list of, of those objects. Uh, but some of those objects, uh, uh, some of the resources that can be accessible through API are not objects. Essentially, those are generic resources, and we'll, we'll stop uh, a little bit on this uh, when we're talking through the next slide. So everything you do with Kubernetes cluster uh, after cluster is deployed and functional is done through Kubernetes API. Kubernetes API is um, more or less standard uh, REST API. It follows REST conventions and REST philosophy, so it provides a number of uh, resources uh, mainly corresponding to uh, Kubernetes objects that are stored in Kubernetes database. Uh, plus, in addition, it provides several non-resource or non-API non object REST resources, like, for example, an endpoint to check version of Kubernetes cluster you are working with uh, or health uh, checking endpoints. So those are non-object uh, resource endpoints. Um, so Kubernetes uh, uh, API server, uh, when it receives a request from a, Kubernetes, uh, from a client, uh, does um, pretty standard uh, processing steps first before making a decision whether to allow this request to proceed or not. So first of all, it's uh, authentication. So uh, Kubernetes API server uh, uses uh, different pieces of information in that HTTP request to identify the person or a component who sent this request. Uh, we'll talk through the method of identification or authentication uh, in, in, in a few slides. Um, so next thing that Kubernetes uh, API server uh, identifies in the request is whether it is a resource, uh, a, a, a object or uh, plain REST resource request. So if it is uh, a resource request, uh, Kubernetes resource request, um, uh, Kubernetes API server uh, does a little bit more processing and figures out, first of all, uh, which uh, action uh, that request corresponds to, uh, which namespace, if any, uh, what is the API group of that object, and uh, uh, that's essentially a type of the object that, that is being addressed, whether it's a node, port, deployment, etc. Et then resource ID, uh, an ID which uniquely identifies that resource in that namespace, and then a sub-resource, if any. Uh, some types of Kubernetes objects include uh, sub-resources, uh, for example, pod, uh, provides a number of sub-resources that allow you to execute commands inside of that pod, uh, attach to the pod, um, port forward, uh, forward ports in that pod, etc. Et uh, Non-resource requests are handled in, in, in a little bit simpler manner. So uh, everything that uh, API server then works in non-resource request is just an HTTP request verb and uh, uh, request path. So if it is a resource request, uh, uh, server uh, also does uh, certain mapping of uh, HTTP uh, request verb uh, to um, an action. Uh, so uh, to an action on that resource. And in most cases, it's, it's pretty obvious. So for example, delete uh, HTTP verb is mapped either on to delete action if it's a single request or delete collection if it's a uh, multiple resources request. Uh, put is mapped onto uh, update action, post onto create, 
get is get, get or list. Uh, but there are um, a bit more complicated uh, mappings like watch and page, uh, and even uh, even more complicated uh, mappings for uh, special actions on certain types of objects like use, bind, and escalate. So I won't uh, stop uh, here and discuss it in a lot of details. Again, it's all documented in Kubernetes. Uh, uh, documentation, but what's important to remember is that those actions are important when you define uh, role-based access control rules because you need to specify which actions are allowed on which resources. And uh, next, uh, what we want to mention is <clears throat> which tools you can use when you are well experimenting with Kubernetes API or uh, when you are integrating with that. So and uh, so the main of those tools are uh, listed here. <clears throat> so curl is always great for experiments because Kubernetes API is just a REST HTTP API. Curl work, works perfectly. It allows you to uh, test and analyze what happens in those uh, requests and responses to uh, great level of details. Kubectl is Kubernetes native uh, command line tool. Uh, also, of course, very useful uh, when you are learning uh, or designing an integration with Kubernetes API. And then two tools I wanted to mention uh, named JQ and YQ, uh, command line utilities that help you manipulate and visualize JSON and YAML, uh, because those two uh, formats are uh, used um, in Kubernetes API extensively, so uh, it will be helpful if you can visualize a large uh, JSON uh, output, for example, and I'll show you how it works. So let's uh, um, try how this works. And uh, I guess I need to switch to uh, my console. Um, so here we will try and see how those tools can be used. So, for example, here I have an environment that I set up using Kubler. So I deployed an, a cluster in AWS. Uh, this cluster, well, very simple, very small one running on two AWS nodes. Uh, uh, I will uh, use uh, Kubler to easier work with uh, RBAC and uh, role bindings and roles in this cluster, uh, but everything I'm doing here uh, it can be done as well by a uh, command line um, because we are not trying to learn YAML here, we mainly are trying to learn how API works, so this will suffice. So let's try. Uh, I have already a kubectl uh, setup in my environment uh, and uh, uh, let's see what we have here in, in, in this directory. Uh, here we have an uh, Kubernetes cluster cube config file. So Kubernetes cluster cube config file essentially is file which includes uh, all information that kubectl needs to talk to the API server, including authentication and authorization. Uh, credentials. Um, so uh, usually when you set up your Kubernetes cluster, you will be able to get that kubeconfig file uh, from the tool you are using to set it up. And in our case, when I deployed it with Kubler, I, I just downloaded this kubeconfig file after the cluster was provisioned. So uh, having said that, let's run a kubectl command which will list nodes in the cluster. And as you can see here, I am just uh, directly specifying uh, the kubeconfig file that my kubectl command should use uh, to connect to that cluster. And it does exactly that. So it just shows us that there are two nodes. Uh, I don't have to actually uh, uh, specify this kubeconfig file every time. I can just do it once by providing a uh, environment variable named kubeconfig. And then uh, my kubectl command will just be able to use that by default. Uh, kubectl is um, 
again, a very extensive tool. Uh, I suggest you to take a look at uh, Kubernetes documentation to learn uh, various capabilities of it. Uh, and one of the most useful when you are learning how to API works, how API works, is uh, ability to verbose uh, requests that kubectl sends. So if you use this dash dash v uh, switch, uh, you can increase verbosity level so that kubectl will, for example, print uh, details of the HTTP request. And if you uh, increase that verbosity level even further, it will even uh, uh, give you um, a kubectl command line, which which will essentially uh, you can copy paste into your uh, shell. Uh, having said that, let's see how similar request will look uh, with kubectl. And uh, I included a uh, general um, uh, overview of those commands in the presentation, so you can, you can, you can try and test that after uh, the webinar. So my kubectl includes uh, an authorization header and, of course, URL endpoint, and as you can see, we are looking at uh, API v1 nodes endpoint, rest endpoint that returns the list of nodes. And then I also pipe the output into JQ uh, utility, which will format that JSON and colorize it, and into less utility to be able to scroll through it. And here we are. Here is the list of nodes. Uh, essentially the same information I just saw when I ran kubectl get nodes. So this is basic uh, basics of uh, using command line utilities with uh, uh, Kubernetes API. Now let's look at various authentication mechanisms that you can use when you are talking to Kubernetes API. And the first one, uh, the first one is using uh, TLS client certificates. So uh, Kubernetes API is HTTP based. Uh, in most cases in the real life you will run it uh, as HTTPS. So and Kubernetes accepts uh, client certificates. Uh, to authenticate users, to find out who the user uh, talking to the API is. It's based on the uh, uh, common name of the client certificate uh, and uh, uh, various conventions that allow Kubernetes to also extract uh, supposed group memberships of this user from certificates, and we'll talk about that in a, in a little bit more details in one of the next slides. Uh, there are two ways to get that certificate. You can either uh, uh, do that externally relative to the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so the only thing you need is a certificate authority configured for that Kubernetes cluster and the private key for that certificate authority. Only then you will be able to sign that client certificate correctly so that Kubernetes accepts it. Uh, another way of uh, issuing that certificate is uh, through Kubernetes API itself. So if there is a user who already has access to that Kubernetes API, uh, he or she can use uh, Kubernetes API uh, CSR objects um, to generate new client certificates. Another way of authenticating is uh, bearer tokens. Uh, so a, a single token that is sent in an, in, a, in an authorization header of an HTTP request. Uh, but then there are different kinds of those tokens, or actually different ways to get those tokens. Um, bootstrap tokens, node authentication tokens, are usually used internally, so uh, by vendors who uh, develop tools to deploy Kubernetes clusters, so we won't talk about them much. It's possible to configure static tokens through static token file. We won't stop on that either because it's considered insecure. And um, I'm not sure if it's deprecated, but it's definitely insecure because you cannot easily rotate those tokens. And then two tokens that we will consider and we will test are uh, service accounts tokens and uh, OIDC tokens. Um, the third mechanism is HTTP basic auth. So it's possible to configure that for Kubernetes API, but again, not recommended because the only way to configure um, HTTP basic auth credentials for an API server is through a static password file, and uh, it becomes difficult to rotate those passwords, revoke, so it, it, it is not recommended way. So we won't stop on that either. And then uh, two honorable mentions, uh, auth proxy, which is often used by vendors again and used by, for integration, uh, for deeper integration of various tools uh, like Uber uses, for example, auth proxy. 
to authenticate Kubler users in Kubernetes clusters. And impersonation. Impersonation is practically useful, and we'll look at that as well. So let's start with uh, client certificates, uh, TLS client certificates. And uh, as I said already, uh, client certificates uh, has to be issued and signed correctly so that Kubernetes can accept them. And usually uh, what happens is that client has uh, their own uh, private key. Using that private key, they uh, create and sign a, a, a client certificate request, send it to admin. Admin who has access to um, a private key for Kubernetes API certificate authority, use that private key to uh, generate and sign um, client certificate and send it back to the client. And now client can use the private key and certificate pair to uh, authenticate with uh, required Kubernetes API server. Um, what's bad in this uh, scheme is that um, the private key for Kubernetes server API uh, certificate authority must be present outside of the cluster. Um, it, it, it can work if uh, that key is configured in a um, um, in the form of uh, enterprise PKI uh, infrastructure. Uh, another way of approaching that is actually uh, issue um, Kubernetes API certificate authority uh, from a higher authority and then sign uh, those client keys from the higher authority as well. And again, that requires uh, that uh, PKI uh, system. So in general, it may be uh, uh, more complicated than uh, you think at the first uh, site, but uh, can be quite uh, often seen in, in, in the larger uh, companies. So uh, here uh, we'll model the situation, we'll model this flow with just uh, an OpenSSL command line tool. So, and we'll start with uh, me as a user uh, issue, uh, creating my own private key and issuing an um, and issuing a CSR request. So here, a simple command to generate a private key called user one key. Now I'm also generating a certificate request. Note that uh, I'm generating a certificate request signed with my private key with a uh, subject uh, line uh, with common name user one and two organizations in that uh, certificate called group one and group two. This is the information which Kubernetes will use to uh, understand what user uh, talks to it and uh, which groups uh, the user belongs. So now I'm, I issued this CSR request, as you can see. I have user one key, user one CSR files. Uh, so the next step, I'm sending that CSR request to an admin. And now as an admin, I'm signing that CSR request and issuing a user one CRT file certificate, and I'm signing it using cluster certificate authority key. Here it is, uh, the certificate is signed. Now uh, the certificate is sent back to me as a user again. So now I have both uh, user one CRT and user one key files. And now at last I can use these files to authenticate myself with a uh, Kubernetes uh, API server. I'm running kubectl, uh, giving it uh, user one CRT and key files in the command line and asking it to list the nodes. Now what happens? It looks like the request is forbidden, uh, but as we can see here, the Kubernetes API server was actually able to authenticate me as a user one. It did not allow me to list the nodes just because uh, uh, I don't have any or not I, but user one doesn't have any permissions in that Kubernetes cluster. Let's fix this. Oops. And unfortunately, I was logged out. Um, uh, give me a second. I will need to lo lo log back in. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go to my uh, Kubernetes cluster and create a role binding. And we'll talk about role bindings uh, 
in a few slides, uh, which gives uh, cluster admin role to uh, a user named user1. If, if, uh, as you know, just I can also associate the role with a group or service account or with any combination of those objects. Now, uh, the role binding is created. Here it is, called demo. And now I think I can uh, send the same or execute the same comment again. And now, as we can see, uh, API server allows me to see the nodes at last. Next uh, uh, method of issuing certificates we are going to consider is, uh, well, we, we are again going to use client certificates, <clears throat> but this time admin will not use a private key directly to sign that certificate, but instead it will use a Kubernetes API server uh, to, uh, to issue a certificate. And this uh, method has a benefit of uh, Kubernetes Certificate Authority private key not leaving actually uh, Kubernetes cluster. So nobody has to actually own that key. Uh, so, and we'll again do the same uh, actions uh, we did before, I mean, creating a private key. Uh, user again signs a certificate signing request. Uh, this time I call it user2 and sends that request to uh, the admin. But admin, instead of using OpenSSL utility uh, to sign that request, creates an object in a Kubernetes cluster called certificate signing request. And this object will in, uh, include uh, base64 encoded uh, CSR file that user sent to admin. Now we see that the object was created. Uh, we can list different CSR objects in that Kubernetes cluster. So you can see there is this object named user2 created 11 seconds ago in state pending. Pending means that it is not yet signed. Uh, admin or someone else needs to either approve or deny that signing request. We will approve it. Uh, Subcommon deny will, will deny it if, if we need that. But we will approve it. Let's see how this object changed. So now its condition uh, or state was changed to approved and issued. This means that now this CSR also includes uh, actual, um, actual certificate. We can extract it from there using kubectl get command again and send it to the user. Now, again, the situation is repeating. Uh, user now has uh, their own private key, which they never shared with anyone. And now they also have a CRT file, which, which includes the correctly signed uh, certificate. And now we can use this pair to authenticate with the API server and we get an expected result. User2 uh, is authenticated but is not authorized to list the nodes. So this is, uh, and again, the comments are included here uh, in the presentation uh, to, for, for, for you to play around uh, after that. The next uh, mechanism to authenticate uh, we'll talk about is um, tokens and the first way to get token we will talk about is uh, through service accounts. So service account is essentially an object inside the Kubernetes uh, cluster which uh, is used by applications running in the Kubernetes cluster to authenticate themselves to Kubernetes API. Uh, but of course it can be used also by, by external clients and uh, uh, we will show how it works. So uh, we start with uh, creating a service account, a command using kubectl. Let me clean up the screen. Uh, kubectl create service account as a1 and service account as a1 created. We can check 
the content of this service account object. As you can see, uh, this is metadata uh, that every Kubernetes object includes, but here is the essential information, and essential information includes a reference to a secret generated by Kubernetes automatically. Let's see what's inside that secret. So we'll say its name in an environment variable, and uh, let's print that secret. That secret includes uh, Kubernetes API server uh, certificate authority CRT, uh, namespace for that service account, by 64 encoded, and the token, also by 64 encoded. We can very easily uh, extract this token, save it in an environment variable. Let's see how it looks like. Here it is. Here's a token in its plain unencoded form. And now this token can be used by clients to authenticate with Kubernetes cluster. This is how I provide tokens through a command line, get nodes, and again the expected result. We are authenticated, as you can see, uh, the server responds that we are under credentials system service account in default namespace SA1. Uh, but again, we are not authorized to use uh, this uh, resource. Uh, next, uh, more probably a practical way for end users to get tokens is using OIDC identity provider. Uh, for that, uh, certain configuration on the API server is required. Uh, and uh, the flow in this case is as follows. So client uh, uses uh, identity provider, which, which may be uh, Keyclock um, or, um, for example, Active Directory or uh, system like that. Uh, even social logins uh, may implement OEDC protocol. Uh, so client uses OEDC uh, IDP specific method of authenticating, for example, or open a um, web page and uh, enter login name and password. And OIDC will authenticate uh, this client and provide tokens back to the client. Now client can then send those tokens to Kubernetes API server and the uh, API server uh, will be able to again talk to identity provider to verify those tokens and to uh, get additional information from the, the uh, related to that token, like which groups, for example, that user belongs to. Uh, uh, the only uh, difference with the previous approaches is that uh, uh, API server must be uh, configured to be able to talk to this identity provider. And again, in, uh, in our setup, uh, I used uh, uh, an identity provider based on Keyclock uh, built into Kubler control plane, which is used by Kubler to authenticate. Um, and we can quickly uh, check that uh, identity provider. So uh, I created a special OIDC client for uh, this demo. And in that client, uh, I configured, um, configured in, in such a way that uh, it can serve as an identity uh, provider client for, um, for an API server. And we can also see that as a part of uh, our test cluster uh, configuration, uh, I set up, let me find this place, I set up uh, API server uh, configuration so that this identity provider is used by uh, the API server to authenticate uh, end users. Uh, to implement this whole flow, uh, um, we, will, we, will, we will use curl in particular. And the first thing that we need to do is to authenticate with uh, the identity provider. And for that, uh, well, again, in most cases, you will use more realistic. Uh, in real life, you will use more realistic uh, uh, flows with browser showing uh, you um, 
uh, login page where you log in and IDP will issue you uh, for you um, tokens. Uh, but in this case, so that everything works from command line, we will just use uh, grant, uh, grant type password of OADC protocol. So uh, let's see how it works. So this is a command that allows uh, a client to authenticate with uh, an identity provider and get token back. So as you can see, we provide grant type, scope, open ID, we talk to client ID named Kubernetes, and we provide our username and password. So, and this is how IDP response looks like. So, most essential information here is three tokens. It returns uh, access token, refresh token, and ID token. And access token is exactly that token we can use in client requests to the API server. So, uh, let me uh, store those tokens in a um, in a set of environment variables so that I can use them later. Here they are. Now, next step, uh, I can use uh, so instead of uh, logging in again uh, when token expires, and this uh, often uses uh, happens uh, frequently. Like access token usually has very short uh, time frame five minutes sometimes, uh, uh, I can use refresh token to, re to get a new access token. Um, and refresh token usually has longer time frame, like half an hour or several hours. Um, so I can refresh any number of times uh, until uh, refresh token expires. So, and this may look like this. So I'm asking. I'm asking an IDP <coughs> to provide me a uh, new set of tokens with a different grant type called refresh token. And this is a response I get back, very similar to what I get when I logged in. Uh, but the operation was different. Uh, I can also use identity provider to introspect token. And this is what usually Kubernetes API server does when it authenticates a user request. So if I introspect token, I get a lot of useful information about who that user is, uh, which groups in the user belongs, etc., etc. Now let's see. Uh, so this is how introspection works. Uh, and let's see now how we can use that token to authenticate with the cluster. Uh, so to be able to use this, now I am not going to use command line to provide the token, but instead I will configure uh, all three tokens and an IDP uh, endpoint in my kubeconfig file through kubectl command line uh, config command. So here it is. Uh, uh, we created a new user with a set of tokens in the kubeconfig file. And uh, we will also uh, define a context and switch that context uh, so that now kubeconfig uses that context we have just created. As you can see, here it is. Uh, we freshly created context called DA admin, which is set to current right now. And now I can get, I can again try to issue a comment to our API server. And again, I am not authorized, but I am authenticated. This time I am authenticated as a user coming from an identity provider with this URL named DA admin. So we can see that OADC authentication works. So let me change back to my uh, previous context with uh, full permissions called AWS demo. Here we are. Let's take a look at uh, uh, two more uh, methods of authentication. So we'll, we'll, we won't go into a lot of details about those, but uh, two more practically useful methods of authentication is uh, our authenticating proxy. And authenticating proxy, again, uh, oftentimes used by vendors like Kubler, for example. Uh, so when 
you see how I open a dashboard uh, here in Kubler UI, for example. Uh, what happens is that uh, requests from the browser go through uh, Kubler uh, API, uh, get authenticated there as Kubler users, and then uh, are forwarded to uh, Kubernetes API with uh, uh, request headers uh, in which actual user is specified. So this is one way of uh, setting up integration uh, with management platforms, for example, uh, uh, when Kubernetes relies on an external entity to authenticate user and trusts that external entity uh, with uh, uh, the right to identify the user. And the next uh, practically useful uh, way of authenticating user is uh, impersonation. So when I am an admin, for example, I, I already have uh, access to Kubernetes cluster, uh, but I want to see or impersonate another user. I can do that uh, and uh, by just sending uh, a set of HTTP headers and with a kubectl command line, it looks like this. So I'm providing in a command line uh, impersonating parameters. So this time I'm trying to get list of nodes as user three from groups G1 and G2. And again, so this works as expected. Uh, we are authenticated as a user three, uh, but are not allowed to get those nodes. So this covers our overview of uh, authentication mechanisms. And now uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, authorization. So authorization, there are again several methods for authorization. Uh, I will mention node authorization, which uh, uh, is used internally usually by uh, so kubelets, uh, kube, kube Kubernetes agents running on worker nodes authenticate uh, uh, using this method uh, when they are talking to API server. Uh, Always deny and always deny, uh, allow uh, are two uh, authorization mechanisms uh, used for testing in most cases, as you may guess from their names. Uh, there is a bug mechanism or um, uh, which, which is considered deprecated and insecure because it's based on static file. And two mechanisms we will focus uh, on now are RBAC and webhook. So RBAC is based on objects you actually define in, in, in the API server. And I already showed a little bit how it works when I created a uh, role binding called demo here and associated it with a user one, uh, associated a role named cluster admin, um, which essentially provides all permissions to all objects inside Kubernetes cluster. And uh, another method of authentication is webhook. Uh, so we'll start with that. Uh, because it's mainly used uh, for, uh, again, for integration. Uh, it's used for uh, Kubernetes uh, API server extensions. Um, and uh, so Kubernetes API uh, server uh, can be configured to talk to an external authorization server uh, service. Uh, so Kubernetes documentation specifies the protocol for such services. Uh, and those services can be delegated uh, authorization decisions uh, by uh, Kubernetes API servers. Uh, again, so this is mainly used by vendors uh, like Kubler um, and more practically useful method of uh, authentication is, uh, authorization is RBAC. So RBAC is based on uh, objects in uh, Kubernetes clusters that you can create and uh, most important objects of the uh, most important ones are roles and cluster roles. So role and cluster role uh, both define a set of actions allowed on certain resources. So for example, here you see an example of a role uh, which defines two rules uh, and those rules specify that get and list actions on pods and pods log resources are allowed as well as uh, actions get and list are allowed on resources config maps uh, with name my config map. Um, role, uh, similar set of rules is defined in uh, cluster roles 
and we will look at the cluster role. We can look at the cluster role in the, in, in, in the following slide. The difference between cluster roles and roles is the scope. So role is always namespace scope. And role is actually an object which exists in a specific namespace, and it only applies to uh, objects in that namespace. As such, uh, cluster role cannot specify uh, cluster scoped objects in the rules, and it must specify a namespace in metadata. On the other hand, cluster role doesn't have a namespace. Cluster role is a global object; it doesn't belong to any specific uh, namespace. It can specify both uh, namespaced and non-namespaced objects in the rules. And in addition to uh, objects, it can also specify non-resource URLs. So cluster roles is a uh, provide a way to limit access to uh, non-resource URLs like healthy endpoints, version endpoints, uh, etc. Uh, <clears throat> important notion is aggregated cluster roles. So cluster, uh, uh, cluster roles only, uh, unlike roles, allow you to uh, define aggregated cluster roles, which is essentially, um, as follows from its name, an aggregation of other cluster roles. And you specify which cluster roles to aggregate using uh, labels. <coughs> uh, so you specify label matchers uh, that so, so that uh, Kubernetes API server can dynamically match uh, specific cluster roles and aggregate them under uh, the aggregated cluster role. <coughs> uh, cluster role and role only uh, provide a way to uh, define set of permissions, but do not provide a way to associate those permissions with specific users. <coughs> Uh, for that, you use role bindings. Role bindings and cluster role bindings, actually. So ro role binding being a namespace resource allows you to specify uh, permissions in a specific namespace. Role binding can, can bind either role in that namespace to service account, group, users. So you can specify a number of subjects here. Uh, or role binding can refer a cluster role but uh, if it refers a cluster role, it, uh, it, it means that uh, only rules uh, related to namespaced objects in that specific namespace role binding is hosted uh, will be limited by this role binding, essentially. So if this cluster role uh, includes uh, cluster scoped resources, uh, they will not be affected by this role binding. To define access to cluster scoped resources, you need to use cluster role binding, which is uh, a global object, non namespaced object. You cannot associate it with a role, which is namespaced object, uh, but you can associate it with the same set of subjects, users, groups, or service account. And this is uh, exactly what I did when I showed you how a uh, cluster admin role, which is an aggregated uh, cluster scope role, uh, can be associated with a user. Uh, every Kubernetes cluster provides three built-in cluster roles, and this is a good place to start when you uh, start using Kubernetes clusters and define uh, access to different objects and different users. So if you associate <coughs> a user with a cluster admin uh, uh, cluster role, you're essentially giving that user full access to the cluster. So that user can do anything with the cluster, and so that's full full cluster admin. Admin role, on the other hand, is intended to be used as a namespace administrator role. So it is still a global cluster role. So there is only one admin role on, on, on in global scope, but you usually associate it with a user using a namespace role binding. So if you create a role binding with a user X uh, in namespace Y, uh, <clears throat> with an admin role, so then the user X will be able to do anything uh, in that namespace Y, uh, but not beyond that. Um, two more roles, uh, useful uh, global cluster uh, roles, are edit and view. So edit, again, is intended to be used as a uh, limited version of admin role in, for, for a specific uh, namespace. 
So it gives full access to uh, namespace resources except for roles, role bindings, and local subject access reviews. So essentially, a user who has added role in the namespace can do anything in that namespace except for uh, providing further uh, access permissions to other, other users. And then view role gives you uh, read-only access to namespace resources in a certain namespace. So uh, normally when you start uh, with Kubernetes, it's uh, so a good place to start is using built-in roles. We already talked that they roughly correspond to cluster admin, namespace admin, namespace developer, and namespace read-only user. Uh, and as your uh, use cases evolve, as you learn how to use Kubernetes and meet more advanced situations, you may define new roles as needed. There are certain of gotchas uh, that need, you need to be aware about. Uh, and the first one of them is a uh, privilege escalation via pod creation. So any user who can start a pod in a, in, in a namespace uh, has pretty much uh, full access to objects in that namespace. <coughs> so if person can start uh, a pod, uh, person can map uh, secret objects in that namespace to that pod and can review content of that secret object. Uh, so it's it's very difficult task to uh, try to restrict uh, access to uh, restrict access to objects in that namespace if, if a user can start pod uh, in a namespace. So that's something that you need to be aware about. <coughs> uh, it's important to remember about non namespaced objects and permissions. So there are some objects like CRDs, priority classes, pod security policies that may be needed to developers in, in their uh, development work, especially if you have uh, an advanced DevOps practices. So uh, developers won't be able to do everything they may want to do uh, if they only have namespace admin or namespace uh, uh, developer uh, permission association. So some operations uh, may require cluster admin access. So which is why uh, uh, it's, it's such a common use case when developers have their own clusters. Uh, usually you, uh, uh, you would be better off if you are able to manage uh, different uh, development and test clusters to different developers groups. And this is why tools like Kubler, for example, have place in the market and uh, allow you to uh, more flexibly manage uh, uh, clusters and, uh, and, and, and different teams working with Kubernetes clusters. So uh, this uh, covers basics of Kubernetes. So this presentation covers basics of Kubernetes RBAC and uh, authentication authorization mechanisms, uh, but there are some things that you can learn beyond that that are re relevant to uh, security in Kubernetes, starting from pod security policies, network policies, uh, and to, to uh, things like uh, dynamic policies and using OPA, uh, Open Policy Adapter, for example, uh, to dynamically define uh, authorization and uh, authentication decisions in the cluster. So I included uh, a number of uh, uh, links that can provide you uh, with uh, references to what can be learned beyond uh, basic Kubernetes security capabilities. And uh, that concludes our presentation. I think we are open for Q&A. Yes, so um, first question we have is, can you explain again what Kubler integration adds on top of Kubernetes RBOC? Um, yes, yeah, so uh, Kubler uh, provides you with uh, tools necessary to manage multiple Kubernetes clusters. And when you manage multiple Kubernetes clusters, uh, it's quite common uh, to have, still have a single uh, identity management system. Uh, and you need some way to manage uh, uh, common policies for multiple Kubernetes clusters. <clears throat> and Kubler uh, gives you tools to do that. So starting from uh, an identity broker running as a part of uh, the platform that you can use uh, to integrate with your identity management system so that all your clusters can use the same uh, authentication mechanism uh, to uh, UI for 
Kubernetes RBAC rules that simplifies managing access uh, of different uh, users inside of those clusters. Okay, and then how does OIDC authentication integration work when there's no password grant type? Yes, I think it, it, it refers to our example where we uh, <clears throat> uh, used uh, curl uh, to essentially uh, ask OIDC ADP to provide us uh, uh, tokens. And uh, we used password grant type, which allows you to essentially send uh, password, username and password in, uh, in, in, in the same request. Uh, this is generally considered insecure. Um, you know, we did that for convenience. Uh, in most cases, you would use um, um, more secure mechanisms, uh, which involves uh, opening a browser window where you uh, from uh, the identity provider where you would enter your login name and password. And for that, uh, to simplify integration of these interactive login mechanisms with uh, command line tools like uh, kubectl, uh, you can use uh, kubectl plugins. One of the most well-known and uh, useful is uh, kubelogin plugin, so which essentially will allow you to use this interactive login method. So you would type kubectl command, and if your token is expired and your refresh token is expired, so behind the scene, under the hood, uh, this cube login will, um, uh, will check that. And if the token is, is expired, it will open the browser. You will enter uh, your credentials in the IDP uh, authentication page, and it will redirect back to this cube login plugin and it will get tokens from there. So it significantly simplifies your command line experience. Thank you, Oleg, for explaining that. Um, we also want to say thank you so much for joining today's webinar. Feel free to reach out with any questions or topic suggestions at the email provided, and we hope you guys can join us next time.